It is now my pleasure to introduce the last speaker of the session, Peter Yassi. He teaches domestic and international copyright law as well as law and literature. He also directs the Glushko, um, Samuelson Intellectual Property Law Clinic, and helped to do something. Oh, this is way too long to read this. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm grateful to you for not concluding that overlong introduction. Thank you. And very, very grateful to the uh, local organizers for their extraordinary efforts in staging this rich and I'm sure they will testify exceptionally complex event. I, I think we're all grateful as well for the inspiring example that we've had in the last several days from really Brazilian civil society which is, has set a uh, a mark for the rest of the world to meet where advocacy for the public interest in intellectual property is concerned. The organizers took a risk in giving the, the oldest speaker the final slot on a panel with a, a retrospective emphasis. And in fact, I'm not going to be able to resist entirely indulging in a bit of uh, historical revisionism. But when I've got that out of my system then, I will talk a bit about the, the background and foreground of one small part of the positive IP agenda. That is, the ongoing struggle to make copyright limitations and exceptions more genuinely meaningful for consumers, citizens, students, teachers, innovators, readers, artists, and archives around the world. Uh, the example we've, we've just been given is a poignant one of the need to continue to press on the issues surrounding limitations and exceptions in the face of this, as it sometimes seems, ubiquitous turn to licensing, which we're seeing more and more, not just in Europe, I should say, but in the United States as well. When many of us were together last year at the initial Global Congress in Washington, I stressed a theme that I'd now like to restate, the, the importance of discourse. That is, the way in which we talk about our issues, the language we choose, and the metaphors that we employ in our struggle to expand the policy space for recognition of public interest in international and domestic IP regimes. I suggested then, and I'll go far, so far as to suggest again today, that in general, taking charge of the discourse may really be a necessary to pre pre a precondition to achieving what we would regard as good policy outcomes. So, as we begin through this panel to sketch a history of the movement of which we are all a part, we need to recognize that among the most formative contributions are those of individuals who over the years have helped us to reframe the discourse. And I, I can't resist here mentioning Peter Drahos who gave us in 2002 the indispensable terminology of both information feudalism and information justice on which so many of us continue to rely. But let's do the revisionism now. Um, origin stories are, are always difficult, always controversial, never true, always in some sense mythical, but nevertheless often revealing. Given the importance I attach to the issue of reforming, literally, reforming discourse, I'd suggest that the, the decade-long historical arc leading up to the International Alliance of Scholars and Activists, which is represented at this Global Congress, an arc that Joe Carrigan has sketched so persuasively in his opening remarks, really should be extended backwards by 10 or more years. I, I agree on this point with Jamie Love, but maybe for somewhat different reasons. Let me make my case, or begin to make my case, by reading a bit to you from a certain call to action. I quote, 
In general, we favor increased recognition and protection of the public domain. We call on the international community to expand the public domain through expansive application of concepts of fair use, compulsory licensing, and narrower initial coverage of property rights in the first place. And then uh, the authors of this, this document, I, I should add, go on to, to state a, a kind of counter theme, which is their support for additional protection for the cultural productions of those they describe as having been excluded by the authorial biases of current law, which really refers, I think, to the category of things which in WIPO speak we now refer to, we now call GRTKF, Genetic Resources, Traditional Culture, and Traditional Cultural Expressions, abbreviated F for reasons that we won't go into today. Um, let me go back to the text the voice of the document again. In addition, we support systematic reconsideration of the basis on which new kinds of works related to digital technology, such as computer programs and electronic databases, are protected under the national and international intellectual property regimes. On a systemic level, we call upon states and non-governmental organizations to move toward democratization of the fora in which international intellectual property regimes are debated and decided. In conclusion, we declare that in an era in which information is among the most precious of all resources, intellectual property rights cannot be framed by the few to be applied to the many. They cannot be framed on assumptions that disproportionately exclude the contributions of important parts of the world community, they can no longer be constructed without reference to their ecological, cultural, and scientific effects. We must reimagine the international regime of intellectual property. It is th to this task that this declaration calls its readers. That document is the 1993 Bellagio Declaration, which was itself rooted in an academic project focused on the analysis of IP discourse, the so-called critique of authorship, which kicked off in the early 1990s. At that time, various scholars around the world in a variety of disciplines began to suggest that the powerful organizing metaphor behind intellectual property law, the trope of the entitled genius creator was in fact no more than a modern rhetorical social construction. And they pointed out the ways in which this metaphor had been effectively harnessed over a century and a half to serve the interests of global information industries. Well, in 1993, about 25 academics from the US, Europe, Africa and Asia, all of whom had participated in one way or another in this critique of authorship, took a step. They came together under the auspices of the Rockefeller Foundation, of which we have heard earlier from Joe, to read a bunch of papers to each other at that lovely Palacio in Bellagio, but they did it with a difference. Before they left the shores of Lake Como, they had produced this manifesto, which articulated a set of political objectives not so different from the shared aspirations of today's IP public interest movement. Some of the terminology may sound a bit quaint, but the themes, the themes are unmistakable. And the philosophical stance taken in the Bellagio Declaration was translated almost immediately into a concrete campaign of action with the ambitious aim of shaping the outcomes of the 1996 WIPO Diplomatic Convention. The informal international network formed at and after Bellagio, which consisted of scholars, teachers, libraries, consumer advocates, companies with stakes in open technology design, developing world diplomats, and others, did indeed have a real impact. WIPO brought to the 1996 Diplomatic Convention three discussion texts of proposed treaties, which were, in every respect, obnoxious high protectionist documents. Two of them we know in much altered form as the WIPO Copyright Treaty and the WIPO Performances and Phonograms Treaty. The other we're less aware of because, as, as Jamie reminded us this morning, 
it, the so-called database treaty, never in fact emerged from the 1996 diplomatic convention and its failure to prosper, if we can put it that way, had a tremendous amount to do with this early initiative in public interest advocacy rooted, as I say, in the academic critique of authorship. Well, we went to Geneva, having been told that WIPO doesn't do limitations, that they only do rights. But despite the strong support they received from European delegations and from WIPO itself, the treaties did not emerge in the form in which they were originally proposed. The database treaty died entirely along the way, and the other two documents were finally concluded in radically altered form. One clear indication of the influence that this, this early manifestation of public interest advocacy rooted in concern about the skewed discourse of intellectual property had can be found in the preambles of the WCT and the WPPT, both of which recite in language that has no precedent in any prior international agreement in the field of intellectual property, the following, recognizing the need to maintain a balance between the rights of authors and the larger public interest, particularly education, research, and access to information. That language is, I think, a direct consequence of the organized public interest interventions in the 1996 convention, in the 1996 diplomatic convention, and that language has in a sense been a charter for much of what has followed. Also noteworthy in the agreements that did emerge in 1996 was the agreed statement with respect to, and here I'll read, although there is a parallel language in the WPPT, the agreed statement relating to Article 10 of the WCT. It is understood that the provisions of the article permit contracting parties to carry forward and appropriately extend into the digital environment limitations and exceptions in their national laws that have been considered acceptable under the Berne Convention. Similarly, these provisions should be understood to permit contracting parties to devise new exceptions and limitations that are appropriate in the digital network environment. And in a sense, that last language from the agreed statements defines the effort or much of the effort that those of us who have been engaged in IP advocacy or public interest advocacy in the copyright space have been, have undertaken in the decade and a half since. Those words invited the reconsideration of the meaning of the three-step test for copyright limitations and exceptions that is, I'm happy to say, finally underway. More specifically, those words were the seeds of today's WIPO-centered in initiatives to redefine copyright limitations and exceptions for the print disabled, for libraries, and for education. And the importance of discourse is well illustrated by the history of efforts to define and to protect an affirmative space for the social use of proprietary information within the scheme of copyright law. The Washington Declaration that came out of last year's Global Congress um, helped to inspire the global network on flexible copyright limitations and exceptions whose interim work products will be discussed in a session tomorrow. You'll note that those of us who've worked in that global network have gone some distance to recast this discussion in terms of users' rights. The basic provision in the document is entitled special cases, rights in relation to the use of copyrighted works. Neva Elkin Corrin underlined the importance of this shift earlier today with typical eloquence when she insisted on the importance of reframing our discussions of 
openness in copyright in terms of users' rights. I think some progress has been made in that direction, but in light of Neva's remarks and those of Vera France this afternoon, it may well be that some further tailoring along these lines is necessary. Here's a concrete example of why this matters, of why the way in which we talk about spaces for use in copyright is or can be determinative, why it matters it, whether we talk about users' rights on the one hand or merely about limitations on owners' rights in the other. As we've heard today, in the coming weeks, critical decisions will be taken concerning the final shape of the WIPO treaty, as we hope, on the visually impaired and print disabled. One of those decisions relates to an issue that Vera referenced earlier, the issue of contractual overrides. Specifically, it is unclear whether the treaty will permit suppliers of electronic texts to authorized entities in particular countries to impose binding contractual conditions on the extent to which those files can be shared with entities in other countries. The whole thrust of the document is toward cross-border sharing of accessible texts, but undetermined is the question of how far contractual provisions will be permitted to interfere with that objective. It's going to be a tough struggle anyway, and it's an essential one if we're going to resist the displacement of general rules of intellectual property law by special provisions of private agreements. But I want to suggest that the struggle would have been an easier one if we had embraced the notion that exceptions for print disabled user, for the print disabled effectuate users' rights rather than simply limiting those of owners. To cast this issue in terms of limitations on owners' rights may actually produce a different discussion and a different outcome from the one that would be produced by casting it in terms of the rights of disabled users. So let me conclude on a very personal note. When I got involved in this work in the U.S. more than 25 years ago, it was considered the height of imprecision, if not bad taste, to refer to fair use, as we have it in U.S. law, as a right. Rather, it was a privilege, or worse still, a concession, or worst of all, a mere affirmative defense. No longer. The language of rights is now ubiquitous in policy discussions around fair use, and it's beginning to enter into the judicial vocabulary as well. It pleased me no, no little uh, bit uh, a few years ago to note the, the unselfconscious reference in an otherwise unmemorable 11th Circuit Court of Appeals decisions to the First Amendment right of fair use to co in copyrighted, the First Amendment right to fair use of copyrighted materials. That's the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals speaking there, not some uh, far out leftist academic. All around us, we see small positive examples of local shifts in the discourse of IP and IP policy. Among our challenges is how to capture those shifts on a broader stage, and it is to this task that I call you today. Thank you.